What's good, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Over Quota. Please subscribe, rate, and review if you haven't already. And like always, the J. David Group, which is my company, is sponsoring this episode. We help recruit today's go-to-market teams that will lead the next generation of unicorns. Email me, web, at thejdavidgroup.com to learn more about how we can help you. Now, my guest today is Steve Hoffman, also known as Captain Hoff. I want to ask him how he got that nickname. The chairman and CEO of Founder Space, a global innovation hub for entrepreneurs, corporations, and investors with over 50 partners in 22 countries. Founder Space has become one of the top startup hubs in the world. Steve has trained hundreds of startup founders and corporate executives in the art of innovation and provided consulting to many of the world's largest corporations, including Qualcomm, Bosch, Intel, Disney, Warner Brothers, NBC, Gulf Oil, Siemens, and Viacom. Perhaps you've heard of some of those companies. Captain Hoff is also a venture investor, founder of three venture-backed and two bootstrap startups, and the author of several award-winning books, including Making Elephants Fly, Surviving a Startup, and The Five Forces. He also has the unique distinction of being my only guest that created a video game, and not only just any video game, but a video game that teaches entrepreneurship called Gazillionaire. Captain Hoff, welcome to Overquota. Jay, it's great to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for, for coming on. So let's just start with what I just teased a little bit there, which is the name, Captain Hoff. Where does the name Captain Hoff come from? Well, you mentioned that I created a video game. I actually created multiple video games. I am a gamer at heart, even though that's not my job full time anymore. And Captain Hoff is my gamer handle. So it came about as my gamer handle, adopted that. People started to use it. Now I'm more like the captain of the team or the captain of the ship. uh, And Founder Space is my ship and the entrepreneurs are my team. That is fantastic. Now, are you, you're, you're, you used present tense, so you are still a gamer, or is that something that you are doing? Have done less and less. Once a gamer, always a gamer. Do I spend as much time playing games these days? Unfortunately, I just don't have the time. The game is my business. Business is my game. So let's start with that because I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs, and certainly myself included, are one of the reasons we get so animated and excited about businesses because it, it, at times it, it can feel like a game because you are um, looking for the best angles or the cheat codes, if you will, to try to, you know, get to that end, whatever that end might be. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, Founders Space and, and more about the entrepreneurs and companies that, that you help. Okay, great. And, you know, games are a good analogy for business because all of us, we like to measure ourselves. Are we making progress? How many customers do we have? How much is revenue growing? How much are users or customers engaging with us? All these different metrics we're using. How fast are we scaling our company? So, you know, all the factors that go into playing a game go into playing business, just like Monopoly or the game I made, Gazillionaire, which is a business simulation game. So I took a lot of my game training and game uh, concepts and brought them to business. I founded uh, three different companies before I started Founder Space, three venture funded companies, two bootstrap companies. Th- uh, three of uh, those companies were game companies. The other two were media companies. And now as Founder Space, I am really helping entrepreneurs. So Founder Space began after my third venture funded startup. My friends started to come to me and they were like, Captain Off, can you help me? <laughs> like, how do I raise capital? Capital? How do I go to market? What strategies do you use? How do I put together a good investor deck? All the different th- things entrepreneurs have. I sat down with them, started to help them individually. And then I took the step of they all had similar questions. And I was giving them, you know, my words of wisdom from my experience being in the trenches doing this. I started to post those on my blog. And uh, more and more entrepreneurs started to read the blog. I named it Founder Space. They started to come. It started to grow organically. And they were like, well, how can I meet you? How can we engage? Do you have a startup accelerator? Can we join it? At the time, I didn't. But shortly thereafter, one of my good friends in San Francisco, which is where I was located, he had uh, one of the the largest and most uh, reputable co-working spaces. 
And I went to him and I said, look, you have all this extra space, especially below. They had this huge basement that was unused, just completely empty. And I said, well, how about we set up founder space in there? And that is where the founder space startup accelerator began. And then after that, we just kept growing, growing. Now we're globally. We, we have uh, over 50 partners in 22 countries these days. I want to ask you about those partners in a minute, but a follow-up question, something that sort of sticks out to me is you said Founders Space started off as a blog. There's a lesson in there, I feel like, for entrepreneurs, startup companies. Um, I don't want to lead the, the witness, so to speak, but tell me what you think a lesson in that just one particular thing is for entrepreneurs. So the lesson is I didn't start with a business. I actually started with demand. Uh, you know, the blog was a way of getting the word out there, test, considered a minimum viable product. You know, right. are there enough entrepreneurs out there who aren't getting the help they need? This was in the early days before there were as many accelerators and incubators as there are now in Silicon Valley. So we were leading the pack. And I started out and when I didn't actually start the business as a business, it was really more of something I just wanted to give back to other entrepreneurs until I saw the demand there. There were so many entrepreneurs who are, were coming to Silicon Valley, not just from different parts of the United States, but from all over the globe, they were descending there and they needed a way to engage. And they needed the materials, the knowledge, the relationships that I had and my partners had. And that's what kicked it off. Was there one or two, or perhaps maybe even three posts that stick out that really um, helped you gain the traction and where you may have found the opportunity. And the reason I ask that is, is because if we were able to identify those posts, that might give us the answer to my question, which is that what are the, what were the common challenges and struggles that these entrepreneurs were having, you know, when it came to starting their businesses and getting them to market? So the biggest thing to motivate entrepreneurs was number one, where's the money? It, when I did po whenever I wrote posts about how to identify venture capitalists, how to talk to venture capitalists, how to close funding deals, the the light bulbs went off. <laughs> you know, the 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 comments started coming in. I I got a lot of inquiries because look, entrepreneurs whether they whether they actually are capable or not. They feel like they know their business. They feel like they understand their business better than anybody else because they're doing it every day. Now, a lot of times, the hidden value of joining an accelerator or engaging with advisors or outside people is that you don't always know the business as well as you think you do. So you think you know it really well, but a lot of times we all have our, our cognitive biases our built-in assumptions of what is true and not true. And a lot of times when it's our idea, our baby, we're believing a lot of things are true. And then it takes an outside force to actually nudge us and say, wait a second, prove that to me. Like, is that really true? To, to make you really reflect on all these things that you assumed were true, you assume everybody wants your product. You know, every entrepreneur, because they love their idea, they assume all the customers love it as much as they do. But what they forget is they love it because it's theirs. <laughs> Other people love it because it, they have a need for it. And figuring out that need is the real is the hard part uh, for entrepreneurs. And that's where, as an accelerator, a lot of times we add a lot of value in completely getting entrepreneurs to pivot, to shift focus, to to or to actually test their market very early to discover whether that demand that they believe is there, is there in reality. So uh, as far as the posts go, really anything to do with getting money, raising capital, that's where entrepreneurs went crazy. But once they engaged with us, there's all, it goes a lot deeper than that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Before I ask the next question, let me just um, speak to my listeners really quickly. I just wanted to say that if you're hearing me for the first time or you're hearing me, you know, for, I don't know, more than You've heard me more than once and you hear that the sound of, of my voice is a little bit off. It's because I'm not using my microphone. And if it sounds tinny, I apologize for that. Um, but certainly other episodes will have the mic. So I just wanted to add to that because I started feeling conscious about Captain Off. Um, okay. Now, as far as raising money goes, are there certain, I guess, aspects of the raising money process that entrepreneurs or founders that are looking to raise money have again that same challenge and, and and that could be the pitch could be in you know maybe not having 
I don't know, the right, uh, maybe the timing isn't right because they don't have the right proof of concept or the product isn't right. Like where, where, do the, where are the stumbling blocks, I suppose, when you, when they're raising money? That you well, I can, I can talk a lot about this because I do it every day. <laughs> I work with entrepreneurs every day on this. Actually, I wrote a lot about this in my book, Surviving a Startup. So in that book, I actually go really in depth on all the steps you need to do to raise capital and how to pitch investors and how to actually close deals in a timely manner, because I've been through it all. So I, you know, I raised a lot of capital for my own companies and I will tell you it was brutal and I will give you my personal experience um, of what I learned. So for my first my very first startup where I made the games early on, you mentioned one gazillionaire that's still quite popular out there, business games. I didn't raise any capital. I literally, I picked a product that I could bootstrap, that I could just do myself with my own money and bring to market. And then the product turned out to be a hit. So I was really, really fortunate because I I basically bet it all, my, my life savings, everything on this product. And then it went. So that was a great auspicious beginning. However, when I did my second startup, I wasn't as lucky. It was much, much more difficult. You know, I started this idea and it was a bigger idea. It wasn't just a game that I could build. It actually required a lot of capital. I couldn't do it myself. So in this case, I had three partners uh, who we founded it together. And the, the most important thing for any entrepreneur, and this is a lesson, is spend a lot more time than you think choosing your initial co-founding partners. It is the most important decision you will ever make because every other decision stems from this. You could have literally the best idea in the world, you know, something that would make Elon Musk drool, you know, because, or very jealous, right? Because he didn't think of it. Um, but this idea, if you don't have the right team, you will fail. You will not be able to execute on it. And I can almost guarantee you if it's that great an idea, there are other people out there that will be executing on it and they will just eat your lunch. They will, they will go, you will like, if you use a sports analogy, you will have thrown the, the, the pass to score the touchdown, but uh, the, the, the receiver will drop it and somebody else will pick it up and run with it and you will lose the game. Mm -hmm. So getting the right team uh, you know, if you do anything up front, and this is what I did right with that first startup, spend 80% of your time picking the people you will work with. 80%. Not building your product, which is you know what most people dive into first. Not going out to raise capital, which is what most people do second. Not trying to, you know, do even go to customers. Before you do any of that, get your team together because none of the other things matter unless you could execute on it. So uh, I had a great team. I had an amazing uh, uh, engineer. He was absolutely amazing. He had built this big product for Microsoft. It was this massively multiplayer game, one of the very first on the market. Uh, my other, one of the other partners was uh, really good at operations and finance. And another partner was really creative and brilliant designer. So, and then, you know, I'm like kind of the business guy and the creative guy going out there uh, talking to customers, doing everything. So we got together as a team and our initial idea we called this company Spider Dance. And the initial idea of Spider Dance, our, our you know, my first my second startup, but the, really the first one that raised venture capital, was that we were going to do uh the first massively multi-user uh gaming platform. So I thoroughly believe that this was a great idea. My partners weren't as convinced, but I was like, look, massively multi-user gaming is going to be huge. Like soon, almost every game will have multiplayer. And this is the old days when people play single player games. You know, everybody's doing single player. I go, no, 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 no. It's going to totally change the gaming thing. But, you know, to spread our bets, we should build a platform, not just another game. Like every, people are building games, but we should build the first platform. So sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? Like we are way ahead of the curve. Yeah. So I thought so. And I ran around San Francisco talking to all the game developers I knew because I knew a lot. I just ran a gaming company. And I was talking and say, do you want to come on our platform? Do you want? Well, in these days, a lot of the developers, first of all, they were like, well, why do you need multi multiplayer? Like everybody likes single player games. Why would I want, why would, it's a lot more work. Why would I do this? Some said no. Others were like, well, that's really cool. That's an amazing idea. You know, but if we're going to do that, we'll build it ourselves. Because in those days, people didn't use platforms. There weren't SaaS platforms. It was very early. People were like, gamers especially were like used to building it themselves. So they're like, well, if we need it, we'll build it ourselves. Others were like, oh, okay, you have a platform. That's cool. We'll use it. But 
we don't want to share much revenue with you. Like we, and we want you to do all this custom work to make it for us. Suddenly, what was a great idea turned into a, an insurmountable task because the, the game developers we could get weren't necessarily the best because the best ones always thought they could build it themselves in these days. So they, there were second pickings and they wanted all these things for us to customize it for their needs. And then they don't want to give us a tiny amount of revenue because they didn't believe. So it doesn't matter how good your product is or how how great your vision of the future is. If your customers, this is lesson number two, if your customers do not uh, see the value there, you, no matter, you can't, you, you have a losing proposition. And I came up with a rule and it's a rule I tell entrepreneurs today. If you have to educate your customers on the value of your product, you've already lost the game. <laughs> Literally, if you have to educate them on why they should care about your product or how valuable it is, you should switch your business because great businesses happen when customers look at your product and they're like, oh my God. That I need that today. That's exactly what I need. What can I give you to get it? I want that so badly. If you don't get that reaction, it's an uphill battle. So I was doing this and I went early. We hadn't built it all out. It was just like in the conceptual stage. We had the core technology, but we really didn't, we hadn't built any of the features yet. So after two months of banging my head against this wall, I was like, no, let's, let's not do this. Let's not go. We're too early. Like mm. I like this is going to be huge, you know. Steam does it today, and you know the companies out there that do it today. But we're too early. Uh, we're and we were. We were like ten to twenty years too early for a platform for doing this, and and we we pivoted. Like my partners uh, had already started building games on our platform, so they they were going ahead while I was doing kind of the business research. And we decided, let look, let's just put out our own games. We don't have a lot of money, so we're not going to put out like you know, A-list titles, which are multi-million dollar game titles, we're going to put out, we're going to focus on a niche. And our second, so we pivoted once and our second pivot was, our first pivot, I mean, was we are going uh, to, uh, what we're going to do is be the first company to allow anybody, any website in the world, and this is in the very early days of the internet, very early days, to allow any website in the world to embed what we called a little JavaScript applet, and JavaScript had just come out, brand new at the time, by Sun Microsystems, to embed this applet where people could chat online because we thought people were going to want to communicate on the web in real time and play games at the same time. So they could chat and they could actually play word games as they chatted. And we called this Jabber Chat. Like, and we put this out there, early days of the internet, it went like wildfire. Literally, without even trying, we had hundreds of websites adopt this app and embed it in their site. We had all these users in the very early days using this, chatting on sites, loving it. We entered it into the South by Southwest conference, you know, big conference. We won first prize. For what, year what, what year was this? What year was this? Was, uh, this was, um, I, mean, I this is the the late 90s, okay. <laughs> very wow. late 90s. Wow. And, you know, so it was very early in the internet, you know, pre-2000. Yeah. And so we entered this in there. All of a sudden, um, uh, things were going like crazy. But there was one problem. And I, I think you probably know what it is. We had no revenue coming in. <laughs> we had all these people using it. Uh we had no money coming. We're like, we got to raise venture capital. We've got to raise venture capital. Like, how do we go out there and raise capital? And there were so many different, um, you know, venture capitalists out there. But in the early days, there were no incubators or accelerators, virtually none, like in Silicon Valley. And we uh, had no relationships. So we had no we couldn't walk into the door and VCs were very closed in these days. They were, it was like old boys network, you know, we, you know, we weren't Harvard grads or any of this stuff. We didn't have that network. We, we, we started knocking on doors and getting some investors interested, but we weren't making much traction there. We're like, we have to make money. Then we heard about this really cool concept and you may have never, your audience may have never heard of it, but it's called web advertising banner ads, totally new, <laughs> you know, no, at this time, nobody had heard of it, you know, so I'm teasing, but, you know, nobody had heard of like, we were like, that's amazing. Like we're going to embed banner ads into our Jabber chat. So we got the API, we embedded the 
the banner ads, we're like, we're going to make a ton of money because we have so many people using this. Like, guess what happened? Nobody asked. We, we, we basically ran it for a month with this service, this ad service that doesn't exist anymore. They're one of the early ones. Okay. Ran it for a month. And we were like, okay, let's get that check. And then we waited for the check, waited for the check. The check finally came in. And we're like, how much money did we get? We open it up. It's like $13.56. <laughs> so it was like, we couldn't even buy a good pizza for our team. It was, it was pitiful. And like, we can't live off of this. Like, you know, what are we going to do? So we we don't know what to do. Like we we aren't able to earn money. We aren't able to raise venture capital. We we are literally, we've been at this for months and months now. We built something really cool that people love, but it's so early in the internet, we trying to figure out where to go. And then we decide, we heard through the grapevine that MTV and Viacom, you know, MTV was basically looking to do the first interactive television show that synchronized content on the web, on your computer, with a live TV broadcast. Wow. And basically, it was a show called Web Riot. And it was a game show where they wanted to synchronize in a frame-accurate form uh, what was on the web and what was on the TV. And nobody had ever done this before. Like, it's oh, so early. You said Web Riot? Is that what you said? Web Riot. Web Riot. Host- Hosted by Amit Zappa, Frank Zappa's son, yeah. on him, you know, and it was just a concept. So we heard through the grapevine they were looking for somebody to build this because nobody had done it and nobody had built it. Mm-hmm. And we're like, we could do that. Like we have this massively multi-server, you know, massively multiplayer engine out there. We have, uh, we've shown that we can build web content. We should just go to MTV. So we start calling MTV. We like got their phone number. We literally start calling MTV. We start calling and calling and we, we, nobody picks up, but we get the phone number of the senior vice president of MTV get his phone number, and we start leaving voice messages. Hey, we're Spider Dance. We have the technology you're looking for. We can do what you want to do. Call us back. Guess what happened? They call back? No. No, he <laughs> called back. No, he told, completely blew us off. So so we're sitting there. My friend, she was, uh, before she joined Spider Dance, she was at this New York advertising agency, and she got invited to speak at a CES. So she got a, a great opportunity to go to CS and speak on a panel. Uh, she kept that speaking slot. She went there and she's on this panel and she decides she's just going to talk about what we're doing, even though we're not doing it. So like, even though we haven't done it yet, wow. um, she says, we are building the, uh, the, the first platform to synchronize television to online content in a frame accurate manner. And it's going to you know change everything about TV. So she starts talking in a big way. We are spider dance. After the panel discussion, this guy comes running up from the audience, pushing through everybody and gets up to her. And he looks at her and he's very intense. He goes, I need to talk to you. And she goes, oh. And he goes, I am the senior vice president for MTV and you have exactly the technology we are looking for. (laughs) Oh, my God. And she looks at him and she goes, I know. We've we've been leaving voicemails for you for the past month. and So serendipity, right, strikes. Literally, uh, within uh, three weeks, we had a contract and they had wired us $350,000. Like we, they were literally like before we even went to meet them in New York, like they just like, they needed it so badly. We were at the right place at the right time saying the right thing. Now, they were a little worried because this is television. They don't understand the internet. It's the early days. We are a company called Spider Dance. What what does that mean? And who are these people? There are only four people. (laughs) What have they done in the past that they proves that they could actually do this? So they're like, will this work? And we are like, absolutely. It's going to work. Don't worry. And they're like, you're sure? Because like TV doesn't crash. Like websites crash. TV doesn't crash. TV always works. If we're going to promote this, we need to know that it works. And we just like, don't worry. And bottom line, we didn't know. Like nobody had ever done this. How could you know if it's going to work? But we just had confidence in our team to deliver it. Like if anybody could do it, we could do it. We believed it was possible. So we just totally focused on building this product. Like we got that that seed money. Go ahead. Do you have a question? 
No, finish that thought and then I have a question. Yeah. Okay. We got that seed money and we were just working like crazy, like day and night, day and night on this, uh, developing the platform because we knew we had nine months before this would launch and it had to be perfect. And do you want me to continue with the story? No. So let me just, yes, but let me just interject real quick. So how long had it been from the time when you started this project and pivoted at least twice before this point, or at least once before that point? Like, were we talking nine months, a year, a year and a half before that, before your friend actually spoke on stage at CES? Yeah. So it, we, we, we started in the fall around October ish. And okay. now, and then, you know, CS is in January and then sign the deal in February. And then we're kind of off to the races and then Got we're going to launch the next fall. So, Got so, okay. so yes, that's how much time had passed. Um, we had pivoted twice okay. already yeah. to get to this point. Yes. We found some demand for our product that would actually pay us money. So we can now eat <laughs> by more than like one pizza a month to live off of um, for four people. So we were working like crazy on this product. Same time, we knew we needed more money because the amount they gave us sounded like a lot, but you know, it's not a lot. They want us to, in these days, you couldn't do AWS. It didn't exist. None of these serv cloud services existed. You literally had to buy the servers. You had to install them in a co-location facility yourselves, wire it all together, get the T1 line. Do like It was a massive amount of work for a small team. We hired two additional programmers. We just went and we had two friends helping us out for free for equity. We were just working like crazy on this product. And I decided, you know, and my partner, we were like, we have to raise money. So we got to raise money. The next thing we did, we got this, uh, we got a couple people interested, but they didn't do anything. We got one guy interested, an angel investor, super interested. Like he loved what we were doing. And like, he would ask us questions all the time. And, and we we're like, okay, just give us some money. Give us some money. Give us some money. Every time we asked for the money, he would have more questions. <laughs> like literally, <laughs> every time we said, you know, and then he goes, Well, I, I'm interested. I'm going to give you the money, but can you answer this? So we did this spreadsheet for him. We did that spreadsheet for him. We did this and now that huge amount of time. Um, this went on for months with this, but we didn't want to let him go. He was the only hope we had for money. We kept trying to get through to other investors. Finally, we met this, uh, this real venture firm, not this angel guy. <laughs> who was never giving us the money. This is my third lesson in the thing. If somebody doesn't give you the money right away, like kick them off the fence, like get rid of them. Don't talk to them anymore. They're just wasting your time. Wow. They are like, they will never get, this person was a looky-loo, uh, never give us the money, but we didn't know that. We didn't want to let them go. It was, we were so inexperienced. Finally got a real venture firm on the line. They loved it. They were run by Hollywood execs, like top, founded by top Hollywood execs. They had this board of directors, which was like a who's who in Hollywood. They even had, uh, you might not know him, but Michael Milken, the junk bond king, like a famous oh, yeah. guy. Yeah. All these people, they're all kind of like celebrity finance and Hollywood people. They're mm -hmm. all on the board. Uh, we uh, pitched them. They uh, loved what we were doing. We asked for, in these days, it was really high to get this valuation pre-launch, but we asked for 15 pre-money, 20 post. So 5 million raise on a 20 million post money valuation. They said, yes, apps, no problem. You know, we had MTV, Viacom, we were a perfect fit for them. We literally negotiated all the contracts. Like we got a lawyer, ran up $60,000. We hadn't raised that much money in legal bills. Um, doing the whole contracts with them. We get to the final point. We're getting really close to launch now. Like we're a month away from launch and we're like, okay, we're all done. Give us the money. Like give us the money. You know what they said? You yeah. know, we are concerned that it might not launch well. So we want to wait to see that it actually, you can actually deliver the product. Your launch is only like a month away. Let's just wait. And we're like, oh my God, but we need the money. <laughs> like right. you said, you'd give, we're like, okay, we had nobody else. Right. So we're like, okay, we'll wait a month. We have so much to do. And then you'll give us the money, but we need it right after launch. They agree. So work like crazy, getting ready for launch. Now MVG TV is getting really nervous because literally uh, they have never done a project like this. They also com committed a huge amounts of money 
and resources to marketing this. They were literally every day, all day long on MTV, having commercials saying, join Web Riot, join Web Riot, powered by Spider Dance, join Web Riot, like every day. Like uh, they're having these commercials, it's coming, the first interactive game show ever, you know. And we, uh, and, the, and then they were, the more they spent on this, the more they marketed it, the more nervous they got. They go like, are you going to be able to handle the load? Can you handle the load? We're going to give you a big load. Like, can you handle it? And yeah. we're like, yes, we can handle it. Absolutely. Don't worry. But at the same time, we didn't know because, <laughs> you know, there's no way to test this in these days. We didn't have load, you know, we couldn't test the load balance and right. all these different things. There, was, there wasn't the software out there to run these tests. Like we would, we were winging it. <laughs> <laughs> so we were, we thought we could do it and we all believed we could do it, but how could we, you know, so we just didn't want them freaking out. So we're like, okay, don't worry. We're working on it. We're going to launch this. So we get up to the launch day, have everything pointed at, at, you know, everything ready to go, the whole servers, everything. Um, and literally then they open the floodgates. They're like, okay, we're ready to launch. And boom massive amounts of traffic started coming onto our our server and we were hosted at this co-location facility we had done all the the putting together of the servers and every you know building out this massively multi-user system um we were watching the numbers climb they're climbing 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 crash like, oh. literally minutes before we were due to launch the entire system went down oh. All of a sudden, my phone rings. <laughs> Guess who it is? <laughs> the MTV. I pick up the call. It's the senior vice president of MTV. And he is using every four-letter word <laughs> you could imagine. What the blank, 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 blank is going on? You said this would work. Blah, 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 blah. Hold on. Hold on. Let me call our engineers and figure out what's happening. You know, my engineers were on the East Coast. And we were on the rest of us were on the West Coast. Let me call them, figure out what's happening hold on. So I get on the phone to the engineers. I'm like, guys, what's happening? <laughs> it crashed. And they go, what happened? Did, you, did the server can't handle load? And they're going, <laughs> we're under a denial of service attack. Hackers are coming after us. They saw the ads and they want to bring us down. And they go, we're trying to manually, manually, because in these days they didn't have firewall and all this software out there that like they oh, have no. now, we're right. manually blocking IP addresses, trying to figure out who, which IP addresses are, 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 you know, bringing the server down with this denial of service attack. So they're manually blocking IP address. I'm sitting there <laughs> sweating bullets, like on the ground, literally on the floor. All of a sudden our servers go back up. Oh. They go back up. Wow. You know, and I was on the phone to MTV and I was like, they're up, they're up, they're up. We <laughs> blocked that the attack. We're up. It ran flawlessly. Once we blocked the hackers, it not didn't crash at all. And then we did it right before the show went live. So like the show went live, it went perfectly. The whole experience, MTV was thrilled. We were thrilled. It actually worked. We frame accurate synchronization across the country, like mm -hmm. where people, because if you were a few frames too early, a few like, you know, half second too early or half second too late, people could cheat. It's a game show. They're winning prizes. They're guessing music trivia answers. You can't have it out of sync. So all of that went perfectly. Amazing. Let me just recap for a moment yeah. there because you know we started off by talking about the some of the challenges in raising money. And so yeah. the first thing you talk about is making sure that you have the right team, the right founders. Yes. Um, because at that point, any decision after that could be have major impact on the business one way or the other. And if you don't get the founders right in the beginning and the people that are going to be working with you, then that could sink the whole operation and use the sports analogy there. The second thing is to make sure that the customers see value in what you're doing. Um, because if they don't see value, you better start figuring out another uh, another business basically another, totally i have a rule proposition yeah go ahead yeah it's uh, the entrepreneur's job is not to create a great product because a great product that nobody wants is worthless <laughs> <laughs> so a, an right. entrepreneur's job is to hunt for demand like yeah. where is there demand out there uh, that you can actually monetize demand that people can pay you for yes yes and then the third one is that if people aren't you know as you're going to raise money people who are sitting on the fence like the gentleman who every time you asked for the money, had another question. <laughs> had another question for you. I have another rule here for yeah. you, for your yeah. audience. Yeah, it's called the Prince Charming rule. Like okay. the Prince Charming rule is every investor out there is a frog. They're just a frog. Right. 
And your job as an entrepreneur is to kiss them and hope they turn into your Prince Charming, carry you off and make all your dreams come true, right? (laughs) Give you all the money in the world. You live happily ever after. That's your role. Which which for you turned out to be the SBP guys from from, uh, from MTV in a weird way. Yeah. Well, they were one. And then we had wanted to get investors after that because we need more money. And this one investor, like my rule is if you kiss the same frog three times Mm. and there's still a frog, they'll never turn into your Prince Charming. Never. (laughs) Like throw them back in the pond. Like (laughs) get rid of that frog and move on. Like I had kissed this one frog probably 30 times. Like so (laughs) 10x too many kisses for this frog and they still didn't turn into, you know, usually an investor, if you meet with them three times and they mm. aren't ready to commit to funding you and you've given them everything they actually need to fund you, mm. cross them off your list. That simple. Yeah. This and is- I have a few more lessons before this story is over, before the episode is over. So if the story isn't over yet. So yeah. literally we launched perfect. What do I do? I go back to our investors. You know, they said, you know, if it, if it launches, we'll write you the $5 million check and you're off to the races with all the, and they had all these connections in Hollywood. We were going to be the golden boys. So we, we went back to them. We're like, okay, it launched perfectly. MTV loves it. We're running episode after episode every week. Now, you know, this is going smoothly. Send us a check. Guess what they said? Oh, they said, we'd love to send you the check, but we thought about it. And your valuation is a little high. Oh my gosh. And we're like, what do you mean it's high? You didn't tell us that before you did all this. No, we 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 will invest, but at half the valuation. We want to cut it in half. Like, we're like, what? And they go, you need the money, don't you? You want we're gonna cut it in half. All of a sudden, me and my partners, we were all pissed. We're pissed off, right? Like these guys, like, what are they? Like, they know we're we waited for them. They know we're totally out of money. We spent everything we have to get to this point. And now they're squeezing us. Like they're going to squeeze us in, you know, the valuation in half after we successfully launched. Um, we had a choice. We could either take the check or we could say, screw you and walk out the door. Hmm. So guess what we did? Took the money. We said, screw you. Wow. <laughs> We wow. said, you, we don't want you on our board. We don't want to ever look at you again. You guys are, are, are you know, you're evil to us, right? Like mm-hmm. you are not the type of people we want to be in business with. Like mm-hmm. you would do this to us. We don't want to be in business with you. So we literally said, screw you, walked out the door and it felt really good. Like it felt really good until we got out the door. <laughs> when we're out the door, we suddenly realized we have no money. (laughs) We can't even keep our service running. We can't pay our employees. It's right before, you know, literally now Thanksgiving is coming up, then Christmas, all the investors go away. Nobody's like, you know, in town for months. We're like, what do we do? (laughs) Like we're, We're in a world of trouble. We didn't know what to do. Like we had said, screw you. We're not going back to them. Mm. And I was like running around Silicon Valley, like trying to get somebody to invest in our company desperately for any valuation now. (laughs) <laughs> like for any valuation, like trying to get somebody to invest. And uh, they're all gone. They're like, oh, we're taking off for the holidays. We'll contact you after CES, blah, blah, blah. Nobody is even taking meetings. It was, and then we can't pay our team. We can't pay our hosting provider. We, we're like, I'm begging my team, just keep working. Just keep working. We're going to get the money. We're going to get it. We're going to be able to pay you your back salary. Hosting providers, you know, please just don't pull the plug on this. We got to keep it running. It's MTV. We're going to get the money. You know, right in 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 the you know right before Christmas, I finally got a meeting with a company, um, and they uh, we had built our 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 front end, not the back end, the front end using a macro media director, which then became Adobe. So everybody knows it as Adobe. And Adobe at the time they were launching a new product uh, called Flash. So it was their brand new product. And I got into the president and I said, you know, we've been using your product. We launch. Will you invest in us? They have venture arm. He said, wow, this is amazing. Can you do this on Flash? If you could do this on Flash, our new product, we will invest. I said, absolutely. No problem. I didn't know if we could do it on Flash, but we'll figure it out. Like, no problem. We will get this working on Flash. Just give us the money. And he said, okay, that's great. But I actually can't lead the round. 
Like we're a company, we have to get an institutional venture capital to lead the round. Another thing that, you know, some corporates will lead, other corporates won't lead. They want, don't want to set the valuation. They don't want to do all the terms. They just follow. We're like, but you, you said you would invest. <laughs> They're like, but we can't lead. But guess what? When, when the new year comes, we'll introduce you to some investors, you know, after, you know, mid-January. I'm like, okay. And that's all we had. We went to CES at the beginning of the year. You know, last year we were like, we closed the deal there. A year later, we go back. We are in the sleaziest hotel in Las Vegas strip. <laughs> it's like horrible hotel that because that's all we could afford. We already had our flight tickets. We were like, we're going anyway. We were, but we were so depressed. We could barely get out of bed. Tense, <laughs> yes. Like our company was dying. Like we had no money. We had no VCs. We had absolutely nothing. We, you know, I realized at this point, a big mistake I'd made. And this is a huge mistake. Number one, you always need more than one investor. <laughs> you can't rely on one investor. Mm -hmm. You never let your investor know that you need their money. <laughs> because if you do, they aren't called vulture capitalists, VCs for nothing. <laughs> they will squeeze you. And um, always, you know, you need competition. If they're going to pay a high valuation, you need uh, competition to, to, sub to substantiate that. All of these things... I didn't do. These were all missing lessons from what I learned. We get out there, uh, CES passes, waiting for this company, Macromedia, which became Adobe, waiting for them to make some introductions. They finally come back with an introduction to a top tier VC on Sand Hill Road, which is where all the top investors are. They say, we will walk, bring you, they walked us into this VC. And what was strange was the president of the company literally went with me to my pitch. And I was like, why is he taking time to actually, he's heard my pitch, to come and hear me pitch again to the VCs. And then I realized it. He is coming because if the VC doesn't like me, like our business, he wants to hear why. He doesn't want me to tell him. He wants to hear why the VC doesn't like it. And then he won't introduce me to any more VCs. <laughs> so this is my only shot. Like, this is my shot. So did you I know that in real, did you, me, sorry to interrupt, but did you know that in real time or in retrospect, you realized that that's what was In happening? real time. I like sitting there. Well, because like, why is he here? Like, I just started right. thinking, oh my God, I have to perform. <laughs> like, so I go into this pitch with some lessons learned. Number one, never tell any of these people how desperate you are. You know, I didn't tell the, the, the macromedia guys, the Adobe guys, how desperate. I'm not going to tell them like that. We're told we're burning on fumes. <laughs> like we're going to be out of business in a couple of weeks. <laughs> like if you don't give us the money, none of that comes out. So I just start talking about the show, what a big hit it was, how we had a million users now, which was unheard of at the time, how it's just like, uh, you know, uh, you know, we have this deal with Viacom, we have other TV channels are lining up to use our product. We, you know, we're the ones who are going to conquer this market, gave, gave the whole pitch, the entire pitch that VC is stone faced, no expression, none. After the pitch, he goes, excuse me. And he gets up and walks out of the room. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. And I look at the the president of, you know, who's sitting there and he shrugs his shoulder. He doesn't know like what's going on. So I'm sitting there and a few minutes later, the, it takes a long time. It was like 10 minutes later, the VC returns, comes back into the room, looks at me and says, he has a piece of paper in his hand and literally slides it across the table and goes, here's your term sheet. But we don't want to give you 5 million at the valuation you asked for. And I asked for the same valuation I had previously. He goes, we don't want to give you that. Um, we want to give you seven million. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, seven million. I'm like, you know, we're starving here. Like you're telling a hungry man you're going to give him a bigger feast <laughs> and he's starving. He's going to, you know, I was like, and then I started to think on my feet. I said, wait a second. It doesn't matter how much money they give us. What matters is that we close this deal like tomorrow. <laughs> like I need the money in the bank tomorrow. <laughs> like, so, But VC deals take a long time. Like usually they take months and months and months. So I looked at him with a straight face and I said, we don't need 7 million, but I will tell you what, we will split the difference with you. We will take 6 million if you can close this deal in two weeks, because, you know, otherwise we'll go to other VCs. And he looked back at me and says, deal, done deal, two weeks closed. That's amazing. So two weeks later, we had the money in the bank, the $6 million. 
Like, I will tell you, this is a lesson I learned. I started, I was thinking like, why is he hand me the term sheet in the first pitch when I had to go through many, many, many pitches with other VCs to get a term sheet? What did I do to get him to close on the first pitch? As opposed to like the looky loo and all these other people who would never close um, at the valuation I wanted with even more money than I wanted. How did this happen? And I realized it was because the number one that I had mentioned during that pitch, I said, you know, the president of Adobe, well, Macromedia at the time, is sitting here with me um, and he's going to introduce me to more VCs. Um, but we came to you first. That Those simple lines, that simple line lit a fire under his butt. <laughs> like He was like, realized that if he let me leave that room, we we're going to walk down the street and talk to other VCs. So he wasn't going to let me leave that room without a term sheet. So that, so my thing is what you need to close deals. This is my rule. You know, I gave you the kissing frog rule. Here's another rule. And I write about all this in surviving a startup. So if people are interested in all my, there's lots of other things too. But another rule is you have to make the investor more afraid of losing the deal than of losing their money. That's the calculation. If you want to close a deal, they have to be more afraid that you're going to walk out of the room and close it with somebody else than you will of losing their money. Then they will write you the check. So let if me that, ask you this. Yes. So let me ask you this tactically. How re because I can I can see that from a mindset perspective yeah. of you know the old I'm walking around like I have a million dollars in my pocket. Meanwhile, I don't. Right. In other words, you have to have that equal business stature, if you will. Yes. Yeah. So, and, and and it didn't hurt, of course, when you had the. Uh, president uh, guy from Adobe there, but yeah, right there sitting with me. Was there, yeah, right. So there you go. Right. Was there something else in your pitch that had evolved that you tightened up or improved? You mentioned Absolutely. Like, you know, so this users. is yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. This is another advice I give to entrepreneurs. Pitching is an iterative process. You never, I never give the same pitch twice because after every single time I pitch it. Doesn't matter if it's a sales pitch, uh, you know, to customers, a venture pitch because they're buying shares in your company to venture capitalists. I literally go over every point during that pitch and I replay it in my mind. And I I remember where the person I'm pitching to, where their eyes light up, where they lean forward, where they're not really paying attention, the questions they're asking, and I and I think through how could have I done better. Like the one the ones where I score a hit. I use them again, like, you know, where their eyes light up, the ones where they aren't paying attention. I'm like, well, they didn't really care about that, did they? The mm -hmm. questions they asked lead me to what they're really interested in. And those are the points I tend to focus on. The hard questions they ask that I might not have a good answer for, I, I deflect. Like, I, I don't want to go there because there are certain questions that they'll ask, like, how do you know your system is going to be, you know, have a reliable uptime or all, you know, that you just can't answer at certain periods of time. Then you need to have an answer prepared in advance for those um, and move on. Uh, you don't want to get them stuck on that because a lot of times they'll just end up obsessing over that point. And even though everything else is good, that'll kill the deal. So every time I pitch, I go over and over and over, refining, 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 it gets better and better. And that I tell entrepreneurs, you, you should rewrite your pitch deck after every pitch. How many people are typically in the room, though? In other words, you mentioned this one gentleman. Where, are there? Ah, uh, this is another one of okay. the things I like to tell entrepreneurs. Closing a deal, you have to have the right people in the room. Like, you, you know, if you're pitching to a junior associate, they're not going to be able to close the deal on your first pitch because right. they're just a gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. So you have to know that. Um, this guy was an alpha, an alpha dog in that firm, literally one of the founders of the firm. There were two co-founders and he was such kind of an alpha personality that if he said, do a deal, he didn't need any buy-in from his partners. Usually you never close a deal on a first pitch to a VC firm when you only pitch to one of the partners. They all have to have a partner's meeting with every partner and they have to get unanimous consent. That's typical. So this was very unusual. Like, you know, uh, in, in a normal thing, you'll pitch to one of the VC partners. If they love it, they'll invite you back. They'll have a second partner there to get confirmation and also backup because they're all very, their egos are very frail and they don't want to like bring in a deal that other people laugh at. Um, so they get another person to, uh, to back it up and see if they can put, and then the two of them will take it to the partnership and then the partnership will decide that's typical. Um, but where you have angels who have total control of their money or a top dog, like in a corporate, like you have the CEO uh, there, or you have 
um, uh, like this, uh, uh, this guy who is an alpha in the VC firm, then they can call the shots. Now, my rule is, don't always go to the biggest guys in the VC firm to pitch your idea. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So if they're an alpha, it's great. If they're not an alpha, a lot of times they don't want their reputation tarnished or they don't want to take a chance that they bring a deal into a partnership to the rest of their partners and their partners end up poking holes in them, the deal and making them look foolish. Like, why'd you bring us this deal? Like, this is the worst deal ever. Like, didn't you ask these questions? So they're really cautious because their reputation is everything in Silicon Valley. Like in, in, a, in a partnership, it's a really, they're, they're, a lot of them are just paranoid of being, you know, looked down on by their peers. So really a lot of times you, and I close this for other deals we did, future startups. You go to the junior associate because the junior associates have, uh, they're like out fresh out of college. They have nothing to lose. They're young and the VCs use them to bring in the deals. So if they bring in a deal and it's not good, the VCs will say, well, so-and-so, you know, this junior associate, you know, told me it was a great thing. And, you know, you know, I wanted to give him a shot. And, and, and then if it's a great deal, and everybody loves it. They take the credit, right? So this is this is you know human nature politics within these VC firms. Yeah. So a lot of times people don't want to pitch the junior associates, but a lot of times if they're really aggressive, uh, they can they will they will really champion you within the VC firm. And VC firms are close knit groups of people. The junior associates uh, tend they tend to look to the junior associates because they're a lot younger usually. Um, they know technology, they're hustling, they're out there. So they're a great way into a firm, but you're never going to close with them. Like they're just going to get you in the room. But behind the scenes, if you make a good relationship with them, they can they can go and talk to every partner and do all the stuff that a, a more senior person would never do because they don't want to put their reputation on the line. Right. So the advice there tactically is to, although the alpha dog, so to speak, would be the person who could get the deal the, shorten the sales cycle, if you will. Yes. The, like the probability of, of starting the conversation is going to be with an analyst or somebody who's more junior within the VC who can be the champion, if you will, and then, you know, essentially bring it to a partner. The partner says, okay, yeah, let's let's take a look at this person. And then if the partner doesn't, if, if everybody looks at the person sideways, it's like, oh, well, you know what, you know, this person, the, the analyst brought them in, so I figured I'd give them a shot. But if they get the deal and it's a good deal. It's like everybody's patting them on the back. They look good. The analyst looks good. Everybody looks good. Right. Right. And the analysts usually they're more naive about the politics. So they don't yeah. know it. And, right. <laughs> and they're also, they, they're also like, they have nothing to lose. You know, they're yeah. at the low end of the totem pole. So they're just like, they're out there. They, they don't care. Like they're much more open to putting their reputation on the line because they don't really have one. <laughs> to, right. To, uh, uh, and th they'll be very aggressive about doing it. So a lot of times, if you can get into an alpha dog, a partner, that's mm -hmm. the best. They can just close the deal. That is always the best. Number two, but if you get into a regular partner and you have to use psychology, right? A regular partner, a lot of times they aren't the best person. Uh, a lot of times the junior associate, you need them to champion you to really do the hustling. Yeah, that makes sense. Let me just ask you a question about the team that you were that you had there as you were losing the money. Did you end up losing Part of your team in other words that some people say no, not a single person left wow it's amazing they all That's stuck it out and it you know that it was great of them like and they all end up getting paid so we were so happy very stressful though you know yeah. my rule doing being an entrepreneur closing deals like this it's a roll it's always a roller coaster ride it just has to be something you are prepared to do so okay that leads to another question, which is how do you prepare to do that? And, and another way of saying it, I guess, is how did you handle the stress, right? And and maybe how you handled the stress can give others sort of some insight into maybe how they, everybody handles it differently, but maybe they can start thinking about it in a different way. Yeah. So it's always stress. You know, I told you I was on the floor and <laughs> in Las Vegas in a sleazy hotel room, like unable to get, I was so depressed at that point. You know, we all go through this. You just have to know that if you don't pick yourself off the floor and keep going, uh, no matter how much it hurts to do that, then you, you aren't an entrepreneur. Like you can't, you will never succeed. Like at those points, that defines whether you are cut out to be an entrepreneur or not. And honestly, some people aren't cut out to be entrepreneurs because we're all going to get knocked down flat on our backs. And it's the ones who pick themselves up again, who prove that they're true entrepreneurs. And, and it's as simple as that. 
It don't expect it to be painless. There's nothing uh, you can do because we're human beings. Uh, there will be many you know bumps on the road in your journey, one after another after another. It's not going to be painless. But you also a, a big lesson I learned, and I, this lesson came much later. But it's that all those things you think are so important that you think are the end of the world aren't the end of the world. Like they're just they're just minor setbacks, even though you think they're so they're so catastrophic. Because I will challenge any of you looking back on your life, even if your life is much briefer than mine, um, look back on your life to all those points where you were really upset, where you really thought you know it was so horrible. Do you even care about those problems now? <laughs> are those a big deal? Those are, you know, in almost every case, you know, 99% of them, you're like, no, it really wasn't that big a deal as I thought it was. And right. to most of the things that bug us on a daily basis, that are stressful on a daily basis, we can't even remember them a, a, a three months later, let alone a year later or more. So you won't even remember most of the things that are stressful in your life. And the point is, when you start to feel that stress, just tell yourself, I won't even remember this. Like, why am I stressing out? Like, this is nothing. I won't even remember this like a year from now. Why do I care? And that really, really helps you. And a lot of times it's easier to do once you get some experience under your belt, but you can start doing it early and it'll allow you, even if you're a high anxiety person, somebody who, who does have a lot of stress, it'll allow you to tamp that down. Fascinating. There's so many, I feel like there's just so many lessons in the story that you shared there about resiliency, about adaptability, um, about leadership, candidly, the fact that you didn't lose any of the folks that you, you know, were building the, the team with, um, you know, the st strategy in terms of looking at your pitches and refining them over time intuitiveness where taking the lesson of the person from Adobe and realizing why he was there and intuitively realizing that uh, guts walking away from, you know, 202.5 million dollars when, you know, it was it was sitting right there for you, maybe a little bit of a hubris thinking you could walk out and get it. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and dollars, right? uh, and, and taking taking chances saying, yes, we can do this, believing yeah. in yourself, like even yeah. though you didn't know for sure you could get it done. Right. Those, when you have exactly. to get something done, you end up finding a way to get it done. That's yeah, that's exactly. Self belief, conviction, yeah. whatever it is that you're yeah. doing. There's so many, there's so many, so many lessons there. Just one other curiosity question I have before we wrap up is Were you, what was the deal with Viacom? In other words, were you, was no money coming in as a result of that partnership with that? No, with, there was an ongoing revenue stream. So they paid was. us the initial one and then they were paying us an ongoing, but there was a big gap between the next payment. Got and, it. Yeah. So we had to fulfill a certain amount of shows. Yep. before the new season started and they would pay us again. So the amount they fronted us was for the whole season. Amazing. Okay. And, yeah. and just so, so how, that created the, the stress. <laughs> that's, that's that's what it was. And how how yeah. how how much was that how long was that gap so to speak? And, and and what was the revenue? Like what was what did they pay you? So this and was they, a while back and it, it's six figures somewhere in the six figure range yeah. ongoing okay. and then we you know, what we ended up doing is getting lots of other customers doing the same thing. So that would even out those gaps. Right. Yes. Yep. That makes sense. That makes sense. Wow. Man, Captain Hoff, I feel like, you know, we could go on for another two hours. And we have, could. Have like <laughs> unfortunately. I know, yeah. unfortunately, life moves on, um, but I'll have to have you back for, um, for other topics if you're open to it at some point. Well, thank you. Um, for sure. But are you ready for the segment of the show that I call the rapid fire five? Yes. Fire away. Here we go. Number one, what motivates you? What motivates me is what's always motivated me. I want to live my life to the fullest. I don't want to say I didn't do it. So I just do it. Name a big goal you have right now. Speaking of just doing it, big goal so, that you have right now and when you would like to accomplish it. A big goal I have. And the day I want to accomplish it is before I die. I hope I accomplish this. But honestly, I want to do uh, more uh, for helping uh, really make positive impact in the world. So the startups I'm looking for now are positive impact startups that are taking big chances, have a big vision, and I want them to come to me, come to founderspace.com, come to me, and I will do everything to help make you successful. 
What's your preferred way to learn new information and to stay sharp? I am constantly reading books because you think about it. Books give you access to the brightest minds in the world. The brightest minds, not just alive, but also dead throughout entire history. And I don't just read one type of book, like business books that I write. I read all types, sociology books, psychology books, books on physics, uh, fiction, great fiction, you name it. I read it. I literally go through probably uh, a book, one, one book every week or two. Like some weeks I read more than one book. How do I do it? Audiobooks. So I'm a huge, huge audiobook fan. I will literally listen at double speed and I'll listen as I exercise. I'll listen in the shower. I'll listen when I do chores around the house. I'm obsessed and I'm just always in the car. It doesn't matter on an airplane going through books. Like I just did a flight. I just flew back from Europe, from Istanbul, literally for the entire flight, which is, I don't know, like 18 hours or more. You know, I just went through uh, audiobooks, like <laughs> at double speed, just going through the books on the entire flight. And I, that's my key. Uh, three A then, just because I have to ask this, do you have any uh, rec book recommendation based on that 18 hour flight or some something else that you recommend? People oh, yeah. So I have, a, I tell you what I uh, listen to on the flight, you know, and yeah, so of course, I want to recommend my own books. I would always tell people, read my books. They're a really great start. But the uh, I listen to not just business books. Uh, what I listened to on the flight was River, uh, River of the Gods. Brilliant book. And it is about the history of the explorers that discovered the source of the Nile. Wow. And it's and so if you listen to this book, it's a harrowing tale. It's 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 like an entrepreneur's journey, but it's these explorers in the, you know the 1800s who discovered the source of the Nile. And it is just fascinating. So that was one of the books, and I listened to some other ones too. I the other book I listened because I was in Istanbul, I was listening to uh, shadow of the gods they both have gods in it just by <laughs> chance but shadow of the shadow of god it was called shadow of god and that was the history of uh the sultans of the ottoman empire uh, another fascinating book about the uh, how uh you know you've heard of suleiman the magnificent mm -hmm. well it was about him and his father mostly about his father and how his father tripled the size of the ottoman empire everything he went through total shadow of God, shadow of God, totally fascinating. So you can tell I'm a history book, uh, you know, two history books I just mentioned, but these books are both inspiring, enlightening, and they tell you about human nature and the world and how it really works. Fantastic. I love it. How many hours of sleep do you average per night? Uh, you know, I try to sleep eight hours. Mm -hmm. I'm one of these people who really wants to sleep eight hours. A lot of time I have insomnia, so I can't do it, but um, that's my goal. How many, uh, I'm sorry, what's your favorite thing to do when you aren't working? Oh, when I'm not working, I am spending time with my family, probably my favorite thing, traveling, my second favorite thing. So I'm always uh, visiting. I was just in, I just took a trip where I was went to Singapore, uh, worked with entrepreneurs there, went to Malaysia, worked uh, about, talked about setting up founder space in Malaysia, went to Uzbekistan after that. Uh, gave a talk and worked with the government there, all the governments of the whole region, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, all these ones about how founder space could help their entrepreneurs. Then I went to Istanbul, met with partners there. And in all these places, I traveled. I, I spent extra time to go, you know, to go see all the sites. And you know, these cities are ama absolutely amazing. How long were you there? So the trip uh, in total was three and a half weeks. Wow, it's fantastic. What okay? So the bonus question is, and and this is something that comes from a previous guest. So I'll ask you which question you would like to ask my next guest. So this question that I'm about to ask you came from a previous guest that I, that I had, had had on last week, and this question is very simple. Uh, what is the secret to selling? Ah, the secret to selling, and I gave a, a bunch of secrets earlier on, but the secret of selling is knowing who to talk to. So who, who should you be spending your time talking to and who shouldn't you talk to? That's the secret. Love it. Now I'm gonna give you the same chance to ask my next guest a question. What question would you like for me to ask them? They will be another go-to market leader within a tech company. So I want you to ask them, if their 
was one thing you could do different in your life, that you could go back and do it differently. How, what is it and how would you change it? Okay. If there was one thing that you could go, that you could do differently in your life, what would you, is it that you could go what back would it be? What would it be? What would it be? And how would you change it? Fabulous. All right. That's a good one. Can't wait to, uh, can't wait to get the answer to that one, as I'm sure my audience will be eagerly awaiting as well. Captain Off, you're going to have to listen as well for that. One other question, of course, which is how can folks reach out to you to say thank you? How, where can they go to get your books, uh, Survive in a Startup, or any other ones that you want to mention? Sure. Um, how, can they, how can they go about doing that? Okay. So super easy to find. Super easy. Just go to founderspace.com founderspace.com. You can go there. You can contact me from the web. You can read about all my books, Make Elephants Fly, Surviving a Startup, The Five Forces. Those are my three big books. And you can also find me if you could go to Founderspace, contact me by email, put my name in there and it'll get to me. Or you can go to any of social networks. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn is a great place. Just search for Founderspace, Captain Hoff. You will find me on LinkedIn, Steve Hoffman. Um, or any of the other social networks. I'm very active. Fabulous. Captain Hoff, thank you for going over quota. Thank you, Jay. It was wonderful. (laughs) It was fantastic to be on your show. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. I'm cueing the music.